Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's uh, service on this lovely Wednesday morning. Uh, or at least I hope it's uh, lovely by the time uh, you actually come to watch it. Um, I want to uh, just uh, also let you know that, uh, again, that like last time, due to the, uh, the, the amazing trickery, magic, if you like, uh, of time-shifted video, by the time you actually watch this, I should be on the road to Kawanyama where I'm uh, going to meet up with the new Anglican priest out that way and, and hopefully make a connection uh, with him and the community out that way again. So your prayers will be uh, very much appreciated. Thank you. I want to uh, uh, begin properly with uh, Psalm 25 and verses 6 to 7. Psalm 25 verses 6 to 7. Remember, O Lord, your compassions and your mercies, for they are from old. Do not remember the sins of our youth or our transgressions. According to your loyal love, remember us for your goodness sake, O Lord. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we read this verse and uh, we are grateful for your tender mercies. We are grateful that you remember that we are but dust. <coughs> that we are creatures who fail and uh, too often find ourselves off the path that you have set for us. But we are grateful for your tender mercies. And we pray, dear Lord, that you would remember us and that we are frail and that you would apply your mercy and your grace to us. So, and that you would uh, set us aright back on our feet again, bringing us into your presence and helping us to walk better each and every time that uh, we come to your throne. So we thank you for your mercies and your grace, and we pray for your uh, blessing. We pray that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your word for this morning through, uh, through Johnson, and we thank you for the privilege of worshipping you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to be reading this morning from uh, uh, the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. And we're going to be starting in chapter 32, and we're going to be reading from verses 22 to 32. So Genesis 32, and reading from verses 22 to 32, the story of Jacob and, uh, and uh, his wrestling with God. Beginning in verse 22. That night Jacob got up, and he took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and he crossed the ford of Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possession, possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel saying, It is because I saw a God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. This is the word of the Lord. I'd now like to ask Johnson to come up and uh, give us the message this morning from this reading. Thank you, Johnson. Good morning, church. Uh, this is our midweek service on Wednesday, and uh, we want to thank you all for giving your time to listen to our service on YouTube. Today's theme is wrestling for a blessing, wrestling for a blessing. The all-night wrestling match with God reveals much of the meaning of Jacob's life. The verses I just, which have been just read, 
report the events of only a few hours. In those hours, we see the meaning of his whole life. Jacob's entire life had been a struggle. From the very beginning, he struggled with his twin brother, Esau. Jacob was his mother's favorite, but he knew that Esau, his brother, as I've mentioned, is his father's favorite. It was a classic sibling rivalry. You remember the story. With the encouragement of his mother, Jacob conspired to steal Esau's birthright and blessing. In fear of his life, he ran from home. He went to a faraway land and fell in love. He agreed to work for seven years in return for righteous hand in marriage. But his future father-in-law, Laban, was full as much of scoundrel as was Jacob. On the wedding night, Laban substituted his older daughter Leah for Russia. So Jacob had to work for seven more years for Russia, whom he really loved. Love was getting expensive. Then Jacob and Laban get into a dispute over possessions. First Laban cheated Jacob, and then Jacob cheated Laban. Their family reunions must have been something. So the point is, life was a constant struggle for Jacob. Most of it he brought on himself, but it was a struggle. From the very beginning, Jacob was a man of deceit and cunning. Even in the womb, the story says, he grabbed Esau's heel, trying to keep from being born first. His name, Jacob, means Saplan. One commentator nicknamed him Graber. He grabbed his brother's heel. He grabbed his brother's birthright. He grabbed some property from Laban. Early in his life, he was not a very nice person, this Jacob. Not the sort of person you would want for a neighbor. And not for a brother either, for that matter. But something happened to him that night in the wilderness. He had all night wrestling match with God and came away from that encounter. A new man. In the midst of the wrestling, Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So God blessed him and his name was changed from Jacob to Israel meaning one who strives with God. So Jacob's sons were the founders of the tribes of Israel. Since his time, all the people of Israel have been traced their ancestry back to him. So they say proudly, we are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I see in this story a basic truth about life. Now listen, because I'm about to say something important. Jacob's newness came to him as a result of struggle, wrestling for a blessing. What I've discovered and what you discover, you have not discovered it already. It must, it is that most significant growth, most progress come out to us also as a result of struggle. Any significant growth come to us, happen to us as a result of a struggle. I'm not altogether sure why that is, but I know that it is. I would like to say something, some things about that now in this sermon. Thank God, men of the blessings of life do not require struggle. The gift of life itself, this wonderful world with all its beauty and abundance, the love of family and friends and God, all are gifts of sheer grace simply given to us. But growth is something else. Physical growth, intellectual growth, emotional growth, spiritual growth, almost all of that does not come easily. There is a struggle involved. Everyone I know is in favor of growth. We don't want to stagnate. We do want to grow in all the ways that growth is possible. And at the same time, there's something in every one of us that resists growth. Growth means change. Change means risk. And risk is scary. But I remember when I came even to this church, I was told that one of the things you need to do is to grow the church. But when you want to bring change, people don't like change, but they want to grow. There is something about us that, although we are in favor of growth, at the same time we like the familiar, the safe, the tried and the true. The things we are familiar with, that's what we want. I can identify with the Australian bushman who said that he liked his new boomerang well enough, but he had a hard time throwing the old one away. That's us. We have difficulty discarding the old. 
We like to cuddle with the familiar and comfortable. In fact, throughout life, the rule, rule of the comfortable and familiar is so strong that probably we are not going to move away from them unless something happens to blast us out of our complacency. Probably some new life experience must come to us. Some, some experience which calls into question our previous way of thinking or of feeling or acting or relating. Apart from that, we probably just keep on thinking and doing the same thing, same old stuff. Sometimes the struggle that makes far off for growth is simply a tension between an old idea and a new one. For years, all same, sane and stable people knew that human beings could never fly. But when the Wright brothers flew their airplane, the world had just adjusted thinking, but not without a struggle. Centuries ago, some crazy people come along insisting that the world is round instead of flat. They were ridiculed, persecuted until someone sailed around the globe and reached the east by sailing west. We have had to change our way of thinking, but not without a struggle. In fact, some people haven't given it up yet. In England, there's a group of people called the Flat Earth Society, still stubbornly insisting that the world, the earth is flat. They cannot change. An old or a false or an inaccurate idea will not be released until it is pushed out of our minds by a new and a better idea. I may insist that the sum of two or two is three. I may invest myself emotionally in that condition. And I will stubbornly hold on to that until someone in the battle of ideas proves to my satisfaction that the correct sum is four. So without such a conflict of ideas, there is no intellectual growth. Such growth is often difficult and painful. It does not come without the struggle of ideas. Now, as difficult and painful as that is, even more difficult is the growth occasioned by changes in our life. Situation, we lose a job, we are to take on a new job, we experience divorce or difficult in our family, we experience a terrorist attack or a natural disaster, a financial reversal comes to us, we experience COVID-19, we or our loved one becomes ill. Some close to us die. Someone we care about betrays us or disappoints us. We are presented with an opportunity and resources are inadequate. You could add to this list, but you know what I'm talking about. Something happens to shake us to our foundation. All of us trusted ways of coping are put into question and we are forced to grow. We have to think new thoughts and try new things or reach out for new resources, that's called growth. Whatever you may think of. It's frightening, it's unsettling. Often it's painful, but without such experience, we would not grow. I'm convinced of it. We would settle down and become comfortable with far less or even our best efforts. So the familiar and the safe would become good enough for us and would never become all that we can be. Sometimes a person will start growing find it scary and painful, so they turn and run away. They retreat into the familiar and the comfortable, and they begin to die. As much as I regret that, I do understand it, because I grow is to move out into uncharted territory. It is much like the struggle of a butterfly to extricate itself from the cocoon. It's a bit scary, I'm sure because the butterfly doesn't know what it is like out there. It does know what the cocoon is like. How tempting to return to the safe, familiar and warm surroundings. But of course to do so would be to die. And to miss out the experience of dancing through the air as a butterfly. I believe that growth always takes us in a good direction. But often that good direction requires even more struggles. I've discovered that not everyone applies our growth. Not everyone is with you when you are aiming for growth. I remember seeing a cartoon depicting a prince and a princess talking. The princess says to the prince, I like you better as a frog. So a classic pattern of marriage is two neurotic people adjusting to one another, function fairly well in a sick sort of way. Then one partner begins to grow in the direction of health, and the relationship begins to be in trouble. The two don't fit as well as anymore. Sometimes that prompts the 
other partner to get well too. But sometimes it leads to the breakup of the marriage. Don't imagine that growth is always sweetness and light. It can extremely be painful. There was a time when at the invitation of a friend I attended a seminar. Some very polished and persuasive people pre were presenting some new ways of thinking about God and about the Christian faith. It was a direct challenge to so much of what I believed. It was a controversial topic. I tell you, my world was shaken. I didn't sleep for a number of nights. I wasn't sure what I believed or why. Because these new teachings were against what I had believed. But that painful experience sent me back to my study to read and sort out, to find out is this true or not. It sent me to my knees in prayer because I was about to lost my faith. And that experience helped me to build a solid foundation of faith which I can believe and stand up to anything. But don't you see, without the challenge, I would not have put an effort to prayer, to reading of the word of God. So without pain, I would not have opened myself so completely to God. It's true without the struggle, there is not growth in us. Of course, struggle does not automatically and inevitably lead to growth. It does not always take us into good directions. We all know people who have allowed difficult to make them bitter and resentful. Instead of growing, they regressed. How sad. We don't have any choice about whether or not our lives will be tied with difficult. They will be. You can count on it. Our choice is about what we will do with the difficult once it comes. A man called Victor Frank called it the last human freedom. It is a freedom to decide what our attitude will be in any given circumstance. Okay, here is the difficult. Here is the struggle. What are you going to do with it? So what are you going to do with it? This difficult that comes to us all. When Jacob was in the wilderness, he encountered God. And the two of them went at it. And out of it, Jacob received a blessing. One reason struggles often lead to blessings is that in struggle we recognize our limitation and our weakness. So we reach out for resources beyond our, ourselves. It is just as Paul said, when I am weak, I am strong. Do you understand when we think we are strong, we have only our strength, our resources, and in the face of difficulties, that is really our weakness. But when we realize our limitations, we are open ourselves to God and all the resources of faith, and then we can become strong. Our world is in disbelief. We have been shaken by the COVID-19. And every one of us has experienced difficulties in our personal lives and in the lives of loved ones. How do we set ourselves when the difficulties of life attack us? On what foundation do we stand? How do we cope? Here's what I believe. Here's the foundation on which I stand. I believe that God is, and I believe that God is Jesus. His name is love. And in every moment of life, every day, he is at work for our good. His powerful hands took a crucifixion and turned it into a resurrection. And he can do it again and again. He can change your life. He can change my life. No matter what problems we encounter, no matter what struggles we face, there's absolutely nothing that God and us together can't handle. If we are open to it, out of every difficulty, God can bring growth. Out of every struggle, God can produce a blessing. That most loved him says it all. Amazing grace. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I've already come. It's grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Do you hear it? By the grace of God, every struggle can be used for a blessing. I believe that I trust that because I've experienced that, every struggle is going to lead you to a blessing. Prayer will help you to understand who God is. When you are in facing these challenges, when you are in these struggles, just remember that God is with you. He has not deserted you. He is part of the struggles. So you are not worried because the person who who loves you, the person who is concerned of your life, is part of your struggles. He is with us. 
That's his name, God with us. John Wesley said, the greatest of all is that God is with us. That I, I hold on it. Because I, now I know that in everything that I do, God is with me. So fear not. Worry not. In your wrestling, for a blessing. Be like Jacob. At the end of it, he, gave, he got what he wanted. And his name was changed from being a thief to someone who was now a prominent position. Israel, his new name. So may God bless you in everything that you do. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we don't like the struggle. We trust that there is nothing in life that you cannot use for good. So in every difficulty, help us to tend to you. Take our weaknesses, make it a strength. Take our struggles and turn them into blessings. As you did with Jacob and Jesus. Even myself. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Let's receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.